you know, it's just, it's just good to be here this morning, and uh, I hope you're uh, excited to be here as well. We've got a few things that we need to talk about before we get started. Um, first is this. This was announced last Wednesday night, um, announced again here. We'll put out an email about it. This coming Wednesday, we are starting a new schedule on Wednesday nights, and so um, Wednesday night services will now begin at 6 o'clock rather than 7 o'clock, so we'll go from 6 to 7 rather than 7 to 8, so just make sure you put that on your schedules. Um, if you show up here at 7, we'll, we'll say hi, and, and then we'll leave you. Um, so try, try to be here at 6 if you can. We're, we're hoping that maybe that getting people home a little bit earlier, especially as the winter months are coming upon us, it's getting darker, it's getting colder, hoping that might just be of some help to, to different people. So uh, we're going to give that a try. So 6 o'clock Wednesday night, plan on being here for our uh, Bible study services. The other thing that you need to put on your calendar, November 3rd, we are going to have a friends and family day. So November 3rd, that's also um, the, the day that time changes. We'll be falling back an hour. Um, so you'll get a little bit extra sleep, but uh, also make it a plan to be here for our friends and family day. We'll have a fellowship dinner afterwards. Um, so we'll continue to get some information out to you about that, but be thinking about who it is you might invite uh, to come and, and join us for, for that day together. So uh, get those things on your calendar, and, um, and we'll do that. Before we get started this morning, let's go ahead and let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father, you are so good, and we are not. And yet you saw it fit to send your Son to die on that cross so that even though we're not good, we can be saved. And so, Father, we thank you for that hope that we have that is only found in you. And, Father, as we live in this world and see the various things going on in this world that um, make us realize that this is not our home, we are so incredibly blessed and overjoyed to know that we have something greater than this waiting for us. Father, as we dive into your word this morning, we look at what your word would have to say for our lives. We pray that you will, uh, you will give us insight, that you will give us wisdom, and that you'll help us to take these things and, and live lives that honor and glorify you. Father, as we've gone through this service this morning, and we've lifted up these songs of praise uh, of, as words have been spoken about you, Father, we pray that your name has been honored. And Father, we pray that uh, we will always be found living and, and doing your will. We love you so much, Father, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. So, um, when I was younger, I was, let's see, I guess I was probably about first grade, uh, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, somewhere around that age. Uh, I guess technically around Avery's age, I had my first pet. His name was Woody. He was a hamster. Um, I, uh, what's that? He did not have a cowboy hat on. This was actually before Toy Story came along, so... <laughs> Uh, th they actually named the character in Toy Story after my hamster, I'm pretty sure. Um, I had a fish named Buzz Lightyear, too. Um, but uh, I'm just kidding. Um, I did have a fish. Actually, I had a fish named Buzz. Huh. Pixar owes me some money. Um, anyway, um, I'm completely off topic. I'm sorry. Um, but I had this, uh, this hamster named Woody, and how many of you have ever had a hamster before? How many of you kept your hamster in some sort of cage? How many of you ever lost your hamster? No. Not a good thing when you lose your hamster, is it? Yeah, we, 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 we have these, these animals. I, I had a hamster, and I, I kept it in a cage, but every once in a while, it would get out, and it would get away from me, and, and you know, Nothing good would happen when the hamster got loose. My, uh, uh, my in-laws have two dogs, Parker and Abby. They're both chocolate labs. They like to, to run. My in-laws have about, uh, about 10 acres uh, where they live. But they have fenced in their, their backyard so that they can kind of keep their dogs somewhat in a, a controlled area. Because as soon as that gate opens, what do you think happens to the dog? They, they take off. They're over to the, na the neighbors have a pond, and sure enough, they go over, they get in the pond every time they come back, and they're just soaking wet, and, and they're filthy. 
So my, my father-in-law built a, a fence to make sure to keep the dogs in and keep the dogs under control when he wanted to do so. A few years ago, um, we were living up in Parkersburg at the time. We lived in a split-level house. And Avery had just moved out of his uh, crib, and he was in a big boy bed. And I remember the first night that Avery slept in a big boy bed. His room was upstairs, and we had kind of a living room downstairs, so we'd put him to bed, and we're downstairs watching TV, and um, I think we were watching, like, Criminal Minds or something like that, where you're kind of on edge anyway. And suddenly we start hearing stuff upstairs. It's like, what is going on here? And so Erica makes me go upstairs to check on it. And there's Avery just sitting in the recliner, looking around. He got up out of bed, got out of his room, and he decided now he's in a big boy bed, he can get up and walk around and do whatever he wants. And so we went to the store the next day, and we bought one of those childproof door handles, um, put it on the inside of his door, and basically at night we would lock him in there um, so that he couldn't get out. Um, we now do the same thing with Macy because Macy is will do twice as much as what Avery could ever dream of doing. Um, but we do those things so that we can keep them under control, so that we can keep them you know, where we want them to be. We set up boundaries because we don't want these things to get out. Why do we set up boundaries? We set up boundaries because we have a lack of trust in something. You know, we set up boundaries for our hamster because we don't trust our hamster to get out. We, we, we don't trust what it's going to do, where it's going to go, and, and, and so on and so forth. My, my in-laws built a boundary for their dogs because they didn't trust them. They were going to go and, and do things they weren't supposed to do. We have set up boundaries, uh, physical and, and also some other boundaries for our children, because we don't always trust our children. And we're unsure of what they might do. You know what I've noticed? Sometimes we set up boundaries on God. We create these boundaries because I think at times we're just uncomfortable with where God might just choose to go. We don't necessarily trust what it is that he might choose to do. And so we kind of put God in a box. And we say, God, you've got to stay right here. And if you'll stay right here, then I'm okay following you. But we dare not open up that box. Because if we open up and if we uh, undo the boundary, then who knows what God might do. I heard another preacher tell this story. It's about a man wanting to go on vacation in Florida. And he wrote the hotel in, in advance. And he said, I very much would like to bring my dog with me. He's well-groomed and he's very well-behaved. Would you be willing to permit me to keep my... Uh, to keep my dog in my room with me at night. And the hotel owner immediately replied and said, I've been operating this hotel for many years. And in all of that time, I've never had a dog steal towels, bedclothes, silverware, pictures off the wall. I've never had to evict a dog in the middle of the night for being drunk or disorderly. I've never had a dog run out on a hotel bill. Yes, indeed, your dog is welcome to my hotel, and if your dog will vouch for you, you're welcome to stay here too. <laughs> Here's the point I want to make. We are going to begin a series today. We're beginning a series on the Holy Spirit, as we've been talking about for some time. And the main point that I want to make this morning is this. The Holy Spirit is God. And what is it that God has ever done that would make us think that we would need to try to keep a tight leash on him? That we need to be in control of what it is that he's doing. What has God ever done to make us think that, you know, we just, we can't trust him? The same preacher that told this story, um, also, to, uh, his name's Rick Ashley, he preaches down in, in Texas, um, and uh, he also kind of spoke of the Holy Spirit in, in these words. He said, the Holy Spirit has become in our churches a lot like that crazy uncle uh, that we all have. You know, the, the one that, that we feel bad um, for not inviting him to family things. But we also know that if we do invite him, something's, something bad's going to happen. Um, things are going to get rowdy. And so we invite him, but quite honestly, we'd be okay if he didn't show up. 
And sometimes we treat the Holy Spirit in that same way. He said, if we invite the Holy Spirit here, then we're just sure that something, something rowdy is going to happen. That, that we just can't seem to trust what it is that, that he's going to do. And so we've, in many times in our churches, treated the Holy Spirit like that crazy uncle. Holy Spirit, you're invited here, but it's quite all right if you choose not to show up. If you choose to, to just be our, our Holy Spirit from a distance. Like I said, this morning we are going to uh, open up this series where we're going to be looking at living life with the Holy Spirit, living life in the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be an uncomfortable thing, I think, at times. And what I want us to, to just start off with this morning is working on opening ourselves up to what it is the Holy Spirit might do in our lives and realize that the Holy Spirit is God and we can trust God no matter where God would choose to take us to go. You see, I, I preached a sermon October 14th of last year. and It was a sermon uh, about the Holy Spirit, and I had said then that um, kind of more at the beginning of this year we would get into a series of the Holy Spirit, and that was my intention. And when we got to that point, I realized, you know what, there's just, the more and more I studied the Holy Spirit, the more and more I realized I don't know the Holy Spirit like I thought I did. Sometimes you can study something and just continue to find out things you don't know rather than things you do know. And so I, uh, I decided to put that off for a bit. And I've been uh, studying this diligently for, for some time, and I think it's time we get into the Holy Spirit. And so that's where we're going to be this morning. I thought about um, starting off in the book of Acts. Matter of fact, we see the Holy Spirit active so much in the book of Acts. And it had really kind of been my, uh, one of my original intentions was maybe we'll just do a series on the book of Acts and really focus on the work of the Holy Spirit there. And while we're going to spend a lot of time in Acts, we're going to spend time in the whole Bible because what we're going to see is that if we, if we keep the Holy Spirit in Acts, we're keeping the Holy Spirit in a box. Because the Holy Spirit is eternal. The Holy Spirit didn't just come in Acts. We read, uh, we, we read all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the sur surface of the deep. And look who was there in verse 2. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God is eternal in the past. The Spirit of God is eternal in the present, and the Spirit of God will be eternal in the future. And so we do not want to limit ourselves to the book of Acts. And you see, I think that's what we've done in churches at times, is we said the Holy Spirit was alive and active in the book of Acts, and that's why the, the church in the book of Acts was, was growing and, and, and just absolutely taking off. But then we said, you know, when, when the Acts of the Apostles ended, the Acts of the Holy Spirit ended too. And I don't think it quite worked out like that. But this morning, if you'll allow me, we are going to start in Acts. And we're going to kind of set some groundwork today, and I'll, I'm already taking up more time than what I intended to, and we're going to run out of time pretty quickly, so probably what's going to happen is halfway through the sermon, we're going to cut it in half, and we're, we're not going to cover everything today. But we're going to just work today on setting up, just getting us started, getting us learning to trust the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit, and, and the Holy Spirit is, is alive, and, and he's active in the, in the first century church. And he's changing everything about the way that this church was, was living, the way that this church was, was working, everything that this church was doing and how they looked at life. The early church was empowered by God's Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and, and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. In the early church on that day of Pentecost, when the early church began, the Holy Spirit was there and it was empowering the work of the Holy Spirit. Or, or was empower, The Holy Spirit was there and was empowering the work of the church through God's Holy Spirit. But it wasn't just in Acts, it was the, the whole early church was 
was alive and they were active and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, but they weren't just empowered by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not just a power. The Holy Spirit is not just something that we grasp and we use. Does that make sense? But rather the Holy Spirit is an entity. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is someone that we can be in relationship with. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14, when Paul is closing up his letter to the church at Corinth there, he says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You see, the early church was, was active and, and, and they, were, they were living and they were looking at life very differently because A, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, but B, they lived in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And this changed everything they did. This changed the way they lived. This changed the way that they looked at life. And because of that, they were growing in number. And, and, and you know, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense that they were growing in number because this early church was being persecuted. They were being persecuted daily for everything that were, they were doing for following God, and yet somehow they were growing in number. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, those who accepted his message were ba- uh, and were baptized And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. In verse 47, it says, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The early church was growing by leaps and bounds because they lived in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But they didn't just grow in number. But they also grew in their spiritual resolve. They they grew in, in their strength. Why? I believe... They were able to do these things despite the fact they were being persecuted, despite the fact that it wasn't okay for them to be doing these things. They were growing greatly in number, but they were growing greatly in their spiritual strength. And I think it's because they lived in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And they didn't say, Holy Spirit, this is where you've got to stay. They said, Holy Spirit, take us where you're going to lead us. And so... We read things like this in Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. It says, In the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm sorry, I I gave you the wrong one there. That was this one. And it increased in numbers. Let's go back and look at this one. Acts chapter 5, verses 41 and 42. It says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And so we read that. We read also in Acts chapter 13, verses 48 through 52, it says, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy. And why were they filled with joy? Because they were also filled with the Holy Spirit. They lived life, despite being persecuted, with absolute joy. Because they lived empowered by and in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and they learned to trust the Holy Spirit. The church was growing and the church was filled with joy because they understood life in the Holy Spirit. This is what we are are going to be focusing on for the next several weeks. So What brought them to this point? What was it that that gave them this life in the Holy Spirit? This is the part that I I mentioned earlier in our class that that I want to talk a little bit about in in the sermon. Back in Acts chapter 2, the the church is beginning on that day of Pentecost, and, and Peter has just preached this great sermon to everyone around, telling them about everything that's happened to Jesus. And we're told that the people, as they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter and all the apostles, they said, what, what do we do? How do we respond to this? We understand where we've been. We understand our, our, our sin. We understand that, that something needs to change. What do we do? 
and Peter, uh, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to beat down our, um, our past. I think that we are where we are today because of the things that have been done in our past, whether those things are good or bad. But I do think that within, especially churches of Christ, we have gotten really good at preaching this verse about baptism and leaving out the part about the Holy Spirit. And so we've said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And we've offered the forgiveness of sins to people because we've told them, listen, you need to come and be baptized. And we get people in the water and we dunk them and we say, all right, go on. You're where we need you to be. But here's what Peter says. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now here's the problem. And this is what we talked about earlier. If we receive the forgiveness of our sins, but we don't change anything in our lives, if, if, if we're struggling with sins, we receive forgiveness of sins, but we don't get anything to replace those temptations, those sins, what's going to happen? Eventually, the sin is going to creep right back in. And so the great thing about this verse is that Peter said, here's the solution for your past, and here's the solution for your future. Here's the solution for your past. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and your past will be taken care of, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can now start living differently. You can now start living with a new meaning and a new purpose in life. You can now start living on mission for God. And see, what was happening in that early church was that people were living on mission for God. And what was their mission? Well, their mission, I don't have this up there, was uh, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, where he talks about going, in, going into all the world and proclaiming the gospel to all creation. And he talks about baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And that was their mission. They were going into the world. They were sending out missionaries every day. They were praying over there and, and, and laying their hands on them and sending them out. And the word was spreading to the whole world because this early church was living on mission. And they were living on mission because they had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now they were being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because remember what Jesus said at the end of that great commission? He said, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the ages. What do you think he meant by that? Jesus knew that when he left, the Holy Spirit was coming. And Jesus, knowing that Jesus is God, knowing that the Father is God, knowing that the Holy Spirit is God, could say that when you go out and you live on mission, I'm going to go with you because my Spirit is going to go with you. And you're going to live empowered and in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. They were experiencing life in the Holy Spirit. The question I want to ask us this morning is this. How do we embrace life in the Holy Spirit? You see, that's been a difficult thing for us to do. Because like I said, we, if we're going to be honest about it, we don't always trust God. We don't always trust that, that God can take us where we think we need to go. And so we say, God, you know what? If, if you can leave us right here, if you can empower us right here, then we'll trust you. But you see, God sent his spirit to take us to new places and to take us where he needed us to go. When we are baptized, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but we need to begin to really embrace that life living in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to look at a couple verses. I don't actually have these on here, so we'll have to go the old-fashioned way, open up your Bibles. Um, Acts chapter 16, or not Acts chapter, John chapter 16 and verse 7. I want you to look at this passage with me. We'll look at a couple passages and we'll go ahead and close up and we'll pick up uh, here next week. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, But very truly, 
Um, but very truly, I tell you, it is good, it is for your good that I'm going away. Think about that. These disciples have been living with Jesus for the past three and a half years. They've seen everything he can do. They know that, that life is difficult with Jesus, but Jesus, I mean, my goodness, he can, he can raise people from the dead. What, what could be better than having Jesus with you? And yet Jesus looks at them and says, it's for your good that I go away. What does he mean by that? He says, but very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He says, the advocate, the, the helper, the comforter, the counselor, the Holy Spirit will come to you. And when the Holy Spirit comes and, and lives among you and empowers you, and you live in relationship and in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, he says, it's all going to be all right. So Jesus promised that. Jesus promised this great gift of the Holy Spirit, and we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized into Christ. You'll look also at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, Jesus says this. Jesus is teaching his disciples about prayer and, and telling them about asking and, and receiving. And you back up to verse 11. Um, actually, let's back up to verse 9. He says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? And then look at verse 13. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here's what Jesus says. As children can trust their parents to give them good gifts, to take care of them, to give them what they need to live in this life, we, as the children of God, can trust that when God gives us his Holy Spirit, he has given us a good gift. And we don't need to say, you know what, God, thanks for the gift, but I'm going to use him only in these ways. I'm going to use him only when it fits my need. No, we can trust that God gave us a gift that will bring us to a new life that will bring us to a different type of life than anything that we're experiencing, so that just like the early church, even when we're facing just the absolute roughest of days, and, and honestly, we're probably not going to face anything like what that early church faced, we can still find joy, and we can still find hope, and we can still find life and empowerment in the Holy Spirit. We can enjoy the fullness of life. And so this morning... Like I said, I had planned on going into a whole lot more, but if I do that, we're going to be here for a couple more hours. Uh, and, you know, we've got, we're going to be doing this for a few weeks, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Um, give you an idea, see, we're, we have all this we could have been going through. Um, oh, my goodness. I was going to be along today. Um, let's get here to the end. We're Christians. We are the children of God. And as the children of God, we become like God. We live in his fullness and in his likeness. And the way we do that is we are baptized and covered in the blood of Jesus. And then we live in the strength and the power of his spirit. We've got to trust that. We can't box that up. We, we've got to let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit's going to do. For too long, we have tried to contain the Holy Spirit. We've tried to constrain the Holy Spirit. I think it was Scott McKnight said something along the lines of what is in the Bible, or the Holy Spirit is, everything about the Holy Spirit is contained in the Bible, but not constrained to the Bible. And for too long, we've tried to say that the gift of the Holy Spirit is just simply the sword of the Spirit, and that's it. And if we've got the Bible, we've got the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit... We know everything about the Holy Spirit, uh, or that God's going to release to us by the Bible, but the Holy Spirit is not constrained to the Bible. 
And the Holy Spirit's not constrained by the things that we want the Holy Spirit to be. The Holy Spirit doesn't fit in a box. The Holy Spirit doesn't fit within our boundaries that we've set forth. And for far too long, the church has lived within their boundaries because we haven't let God outside of our boundaries. And so from, from here on out, we need to start opening the door for the Holy Spirit, for God to work beyond our boundaries. And when the Holy Spirit goes beyond the boundaries we've set, we've got to trust it when the Holy Spirit takes us with him. And so this morning, I'm asking you just simply to embrace the gift of the Holy Spirit and trust that God gives us good gifts. We're going to unpack this more for the next several weeks, so this isn't everything you're going to hear, so, uh, so plan on being back here next week, and, and we'll dive into this more. But here's what, what I want to say. As Christians, we're going to go where the Holy Spirit takes us. And this church, in our lives, and in everything around us, we're going to start seeing big changes because the Holy Spirit is going to be unleashed. We're going to ask you to go with us. And so Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of, of your sins. We want you to have the forgiveness of your sins, but take hold of that gift also. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to go with us on this, this unbelievable ride, that we're going to go beyond the boundaries of what we've set for ourselves, if you want to go with us and follow the Holy Spirit and trust him in everything that he takes us on, we're inviting you now to accept that gift. And so if we can help you this morning, if you need prayers, we've got uh, an elder in the back. He'd be happy to pray with you. You can come up front and we can pray, uh, we can pray together. If, if you need to put Christ on in baptism to receive the forgiveness of your sins and to embrace and begin to trust the gift of the Holy Spirit, our baptistry is ready. Come with us on this journey. If we can help you in any way, please come now as we stand and as we sing.